Hello, I'm Oliver Gao, and uh, I'm uh, the director of Cornell System Engineering Program. Today, uh, we have our guest, Professor Peter Enns, uh, who is a professor in the Department of Government and executive director of the Roper Center for Public Opinion Research at Cornell University. And he's also the team leader of the Institute for Social Science Theme Project on the causes, consequences, and the future of mass inc incarceration in the United States and a former faculty director of Cornell's prison education program. So welcome, Peter. Thanks. Can you start by telling us how your career path got you to this kind of research? Yeah, sure. Um, I've, in, in graduate school, I started getting interested in, in public opinion and looking at public opinion changing over time and really thinking about how I was interested in does the government respond to changes in public opinion and why does the public opinion change? You know, and and um, when I got to Cornell, I heard about Cornell's prison education program, and so I got involved with that program. And Mary Katzenstein is a colleague of mine in the government department. She was involved too, and so she suggested I start doing some research on public opinion and the rise of the incarceration rate in the United States, mm -hmm. and so. Based on her suggestion, I wrote a paper, and then at various conferences and talks, I got more and more questions, and that eventually led to, developed into the book, Incarceration mm -hmm. Nation. So I didn't start out to write the book. It was just a blending of interest, uh -huh. and it became an ongoing project. And I think you mentioned several times, like public opinion. You mentioned you, you started being interested in this ever since you started your PhD study. So, but now if you think back, you think, of course, you know, our society and how our society uh, is operated, uh, especially in this country. Why do you think public opinion is so important? And why did uh, you know, public opinion, this kind of research, attract you? Yeah, sure. I, I think on one level where, well, I mean, I guess it fits. Prior to graduate school, I was teaching high school in Baltimore, Maryland. And that's a school district that had a lot of challenges. And so mm -hmm. I, one question I had prior to graduate school was, if we know how to run good schools, we know how to have a good curriculum, we know what makes good teachers, why do we have school districts that aren't doing well? And so to me, public opinion became a part of this. Try to understand when we know the path forward, mm -hmm. why does that not become the path politicians follow? That why do we not get the policies we might expect? So to me, public opinion is an important part of that. And so that's why I've always been interested in, in what is the public want, are politicians listening to it? And then there's another element of, when we talk about public opinion, who are we talking about? Is it just the average citizen? Is it, do some people's preferences get represented more than others? And mm -hmm. so then some of my research went into trying to understand whose views get represented, and, but really trying to think of, to better understand why we get the policies we get I felt that public opinion was a crucial element to understand that. So, yeah, I think I, I totally agree with you. That's true. And apparently, kind of, I think, like when you were teaching back in Maryland and you were starting thinking from your observation, you were thinking about where the root of the problem was. Yeah. And then that probably led you uh, to public opinion, right? So, and, uh, and then in this country, so what do you think as the relationship between public opinion and democracy. Yeah, I think they, especially in the United States, I think we need to think of a few things. The, the public very rarely, if you think of, uh, knows exactly what policy it wants and very specific things don't happen. So we often hear members of the public frustrated feeling like politicians don't represent their views because they might say, I have... Uh, on one particular issue, on immigration, here's the policy I want. And on welfare spending, here's what I want. And I want this spending on infrastructure. And so from the individual's point of view, it feels like politicians aren't representing them. But if we take a step back and look at, is the public becoming more liberal or conservative? Then the political system follows those changes. And so mm -hmm. like we talked about in my talk today, as the public became more punitive, the criminal justice system became much more punitive. So if we think of it at a very high level macro perspective, changes in public opinion 
translate into political changes and translate into policy changes. If we think of it as what does the public think about this very specific policy that's being discussed now, it's much harder to observe that direct connection. Mm -hmm. I see. So, uh, so essentially, Right, at, you know, democracy and also public opinions, at least the two things I can think of now, they are really, I think, the, the fundamental building blocks um, as a country's, like a f at the foundation level, the infrastructure, like public opinion and the democracy, and then that leads to the operation and the management of our societal system here in this country. So uh, that actually leads me to the question, how public opinion and the democracy, they're supposedly to be linked or implemented by what you call kind of this macro political system, mm -hmm. right? So what's your view about that linkage? I mean, public opinion, democracy, and the macro political system. How do you, what's your view about the linkage now? And what, would, what, if, what should it be? Yeah, no, that's a really, a really great question because on the one hand, we think, Politicians should respond to public opinion. On the other hand, you know, we're sort of, since the founding of this country, there's concerns with the potential of the tyranny of the majority, right? What mm -hmm. if the majority wants an outcome that is bad for society, or um, even bad for a certain segment of the society? So I think there's there's no simple answer. I think it depends on the the context. And one of the goals I think is making sure the public's as informed as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think another goal is um, politicians, although they should ideally think about what their constituents want and think about uh, what the public wants, that's not the only factor that should matter. And so they need to also be attentive of broader consequences, maybe long-term consequences that the public might not be fully aware of. Mm -hmm. um, politicians have more access to information. And so it's it's a balance, and that may vary depending on the issue. Yeah, I I, I think that, that that's really important, especially you know I still remember like in, on the second slide, uh, in your talk you show these kind of arrows, linking the crime and news media, public opinion, and a crime justice policy. Right? Of course, you you emphasize that actually, in the end, this kind of crime justice policy will have a narrow pointing back all the way to crime. Yeah. Right, this kind of feedback loop. So, uh, you know, theoretically, and everybody sees both the associative as well as car you know, causal linkages along these uh, segments. Uh, right? However, in reality, uh, even I think kind of uh, the organizing the causality, chicken and egg, which one causes which one. Yeah. Like based on your talk, I, I, I think it seemed to be uh, very hard. So, and in that case, of course, we want to figure out first the causality, and then we want to design control measures to, to drive it towards some healthy outcomes. So what are the, in all these linkages, what are the key challenges or difficulties for, from both in the research as well as kind of practical point of view. Yeah, so, right, because in the, I mean, in the real world, politics is complicated, and so it's not just one thing causes the other, but there's interdependencies. And one of the challenges is, is I think, always with data, and getting data and mm -hmm. data over long enough time periods and, 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 and measured precisely enough to really understand uh, the interrelationships between, let's say, news coverage of crime and the actual crime rate and the public's response and how the criminal justice system responds. Uh, and most all of my research is very data-oriented, but I, I think in the book, one of the ways that was most successful was actually going to um, archives to seeing what people were saying at the time. So the example from the talk with Nixon's campaign in 68, where they're actually circulating internal campaign memos showing that they're following public opinion polls and noticing the public's concern with crime, that to me is a real, real important addition to the quantitative analysis because yes. it gives us a, a lens into how the people we're trying to study at the time were actually thinking about this. And then when the, when the data um, also show the same relationships, we now, I think, have a sense of, okay, how did the... The data fit together, 
and yet what was going on behind the scenes. So I, I mm -hmm. think in that sense, um, really, uh, you know, always trying to get as much data as possible, thinking really carefully about measurement in the data, but also going beyond the data to what other sources of information can we get to understand what was happening. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And actually, I very much appreciate uh, your emphasis you know, on this kind of data-based approach uh, because you can see that in a, a hypothesis, anyone can come up with a hypothesis. However, whether that hypothesis can be tested in a rigorous way or not. And I think that's actually where, you know, what distinguishes a, a scholar, a researcher from from not the right word, from like a politician, <laughs> right? So, so in that sense, we are talking about this database approach. And I think at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned, uh, I think as probably the last bullet on one of the slides, you were saying that um, there is, I don't know whether it's causality or at the least it was an association. You were saying that when the public had less confidence in the judicial system, they would become more punitive, mm -hmm. right? So I'll probably kind of like to discuss with you about this uh, to further depth, because think about this. Me as a public, when I become less confident in the judicial system, which means, they, which means that the judicial system is not as capable as what I have wished. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, that's the judicial system's fault. However, and me, what reaction I can think of, for example, when I you know, respond to those surveys, I say, punish those criminals. Mm -hmm. But not, instead of improving the judicial system. So which means like kind of you know, the criminals could become the goat. Yeah. So what, what's your opinion? Yeah, no, I, th I think that's actually... Uh a really likely explanation for the, the patterns we see in the data, in the, meaning that when there's less confidence in the judicial system, it's often because there's a desire to see more done. So there's a concern with crime and feeling like the judicial system's not doing enough. So mm -hmm. we could think that a lack of confidence means um, it's not doing a good job, we need to try something different you know, maybe mm -hmm. a more rehabilitative approach or we need to um, try to address the roots of crime. But it turns out, at least for the period uh, I'm analyzing, that, and, and that's essentially from, you know, a long time period, from the 1950s to about 2010, during that period, for most respondents, when there's less confidence, it's reflecting that lack of confidence means they want more done. They want tougher prison sentences. They want more police on the streets. They want a tougher approach to being on crime. So it's not, I'm, I'm not confident in it. This isn't working. Let's try something else. It's this not enough is being done. That's the lack of confidence. We need to do more. Wow, I see. So actually, that's why probably, I, you know, like as you emphasize, that's why actually public opinion and also the role that news agents or media plays because... For example, if the real problem is lying in, is lying in, like the one is a kind of the non competency of the judicial system, and then, however, the, if the if the public is not very well informed of this, they will always blame the criminals, and plus, you know, the criminals are those are only those that have been identified, uh, right? You know, you, you put them in three years into the prison versus six years into the prison, but you are essentially still working on the same sample, on the same group of people. However, like the feeling of, you know, this kind of societal safety or this security, even when you put those things, you, you, even when you put those people kind of the, for example, the bottom tail into prison for a longer time. However, there is still some people about the tail that are causing the trouble but they are not caught. Mm -hmm. Those people, so that's kind of through the media communication, how can we, and I really like you, you I think in the talk you talk about, in addition to punishing those who have been caught, how are we going to kind of improve the whole society, the whole kind of 
uh, you know, this kind of public safety or this kind of uh, a judicial system so that we can have more preventive power. Yeah. But is there any proving relationship with that when the public or the judicial system becomes more punitive, means that we have less crime? Is there any? Yeah, no, I, I mean, that. it's a lot of really important points there in terms of how are we treating those who have been convicted of a crime and the, the, the effects that can have on their, their families or their, their communities. Uh, and really, the severity of the, the research shows the severity of the punishment does not deter future crime. And you could kind of think of that in terms of nobody wants a long prison sentence, but if somebody's getting close you know, to a criminal act, they're not thinking so much of the exact sentence length. That's not mm-hmm. driving the behavior. And so yeah. the, 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 the best research on this shows longer sentences don't have a deterrent effect. But they cost a lot more. Mm-hmm. They make it a lot harder for the individual in prison to, once they're released, to readjust to society. They make it harder to get a job. If lots of, uh, I, I mentioned about over 2 million children have a parent incarcerated. So if we extend these prison sentences and it has all these negative effects and doesn't deter crime, it's, it's just as a problematic approach. And, and I think another thing you mentioned, Oliver, with how the news covers crime it really f- tends to focus on the crime committed and no broader context. And we could think about it how if you ever have heard somebody who had um, like a family member who, uh, or a friend of the family who committed a crime, you often hear things like, you know, say a kid uh, commits a crime. They, uh, well, he's a good kid or she's a good kid, made one bad decision. And mm-hmm. well, you know, made a bad decision. Uh, but he or she was hanging out with some friends and then they got caught up in this thing and it kind of went out of control. Like you, you, People who know the person who did it when it's a friend or family member immediately latch onto the context and what else could explain the behavior mm-hmm. and that it doesn't reflect that individual's whole being and what what's the best solution? Is it, if it was drug related, is it treatment? If it was a bad decision, is it, how do we make sure that we don't get another bad decision? When it's news covering crime, it's focusing on the person who did it just as the criminal. Not thinking like, well, how is this person? This person isn't always doing bad things. You know, what do friends say about this person? Maybe normally a really good person. Maybe very something very specific happened. Maybe had an addiction and couldn't get treatment. And so I think the, the lens of when we know somebody versus when media is depicting a crime committed by a stranger, it has very different effects on how we view what happened, but also what we think the appropriate response should be. Yeah, so now, uh, you know, thank you. Now I realize it's really, you know, kind of the, 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 the important role that media plays, kind of, it's really kind of linking, it's not, it's, it's not just simply linking, however, just kind of a bridge between the public and then whatever decision. It could be a government decision, it could be an organizational decision. So, and that's also kind of now I'm becoming more and more kind of excited about the kind of social science research, especially this kind of research. Like, as engineers, when we do research, basically as a civil engineer, I deal with, okay, for this room, how many steel bars I need to put in a column, right? If I do the calculation of the strength, that's done. Yep. However, now, look at this kind of human society that, you know, you're working on, um, even between media, I, I see that, I see now kind of the public and the representatives of the public, in which it's really, we need a very uh, independent and a neutral like a media system, mm-hmm. right? To, because you said it's really kind of objective informing of both sides. However, as you talked, the government, even the candidate, candidate they are they are not necessarily, like you, you show the example of Nixon, mm-hmm. right? Early on, he, had, he didn't have an opinion about crime, but then by following the public, he started playing that car. Yeah. So which means that, you know, they are following public opinion. And then, of course, media. And also, like, also I think you probably, I don't know if, if the, it was the right slide, you have, you have a slide where the, there was a book say, 
where it bleeds, it it leads. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if that is probably if that's kind of the media, I mean, in that way, kind of media, they are not necessarily kind of trying to promote or publicize what we, what they believe is right. They are instead also following the public opinion. And what if the public opinion is wrong or misguided? Whoever has misguided this. So coming back to, you know, in the social science study or kind of any study, ethics yeah. and uh, professionalism. How? Because otherwise, if there's no one strongly sticking to the root ethics and the, you know, kind of the truth or the right, for example, if somehow the public opinion, because some kind of random reason, get distracted, deviated, and then government follows that, media follows that, is there any way we can come back? Yeah, no, it's the, these questions that, that media, um, I think individual journalists have to think about, but also the broader companies, they're trying to make money and they're trying to think of their audience. And so not only is it what they cover, but they face decisions about how to cover it. So if you're covering a, a crime story, you only have so much time or so many words in your article, and then you want to leave an impact. And so what's going to lead the most memorable impact on your audience? Is it a explanation of the broader context and the details to help really your reader or viewer make the best decision? Mm -hmm. Or is it a more sensationalist headline or picture? Yeah. And so I think um, from a profit-oriented perspective, media often face an incentive to focus more narrowly uh, and sort of frame the story in a sort of simplistic and easy to mem more memorable way. Mm -hmm. But in terms of informing the public, that may actually be leading the public to reach the wrong conclusion. And so maybe not, maybe it leads the public to become more punitive where if the same story said crimes increased, here's some information on which policies lead to less crime or how, we, how should government spend its money to have the biggest impact on crime. But those details, if they show up at all, uh -huh. are late in, the, late in the newspaper article. I see. Wow. So, so in that case, um, and again, I, now at this point, I would like to bring up, you know, the book you had, mm -hmm. uh, in Incarceration Nation. I think that was a great book. Actually, for the preparation, I kind of I read into the first few chapters. Uh, but I think so. Kind of from your point of view, what are the key storylines you were trying to tell? in this book and what do you want a general reader to take away from your book? Yeah, no, great. I mean, I think one important aspect is that political decisions were involved in the rise of mass incarceration in the United States. So it's not just as simple as more crime was committed and more people were incarcerated, but how we treat crime and how we treat criminals, is specific, what's counted as a crime what, how long punishment and sentences are, how we treat crime change. That's the underlying factor. But then I wanted to go a step farther and explain why, if it's political decisions that are behind the rise of mass incarceration, what led to those political decisions? Mm -hmm. And that's the real core of the book. And that's where looking at how public opinion on the issue changed over time and why the public became more punitive and how media coverage of rising crime rates is what pushed the public in this more punitive direction. So that full, full picture of how we, it wasn't an accident that we got to, that the United States now has the highest incarceration rate in the world. It was a set of decisions, and those decisions reflected an increasingly punitive public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I probably want to kind of chat with you from a, a slightly different perspective. So here, We've been talking a lot about public opinion, mm -hmm. and of course, we assume that public opinion is playing a very important role in everything that is uh, uh, happening in this society. So, and then, kind of coming back to reality, look at our everyday society, right? Things happen in a what I feel in a hierarchical structure. 
right? For example, the president says something, and then his surroundings and a bigger group, and then in the end, the general public. Yeah. Right. So I think this probably this is the top down. Of course, there is a bottom up, but mm -hmm. I, I believe there is always, um, you know, there is always a, a hierarchical structure, and, and of course also for this for any society we say that we have kind of uh, in this kind of uh, football shaped like distribution, right? Yeah. So yeah. So in that sense. Yes, public opinion is very important, and we should abide by, we should respect public opinion. However, public opinion is not always right, right? In that case, of course, corresponding to the public, like there is this word also coming up, elite. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. is also elite opinion. Yep. So what's your view about the elite opinion versus public opinion and their role in our society, in our macro political systems. Yeah, no, that that's great and important. And I, I think when we say elite opinion, we could think of it in a couple ways. So some people will consider media as part of that elite opinion. So what, how uh, uh, journalists and, and news organizations as, as, as media elites, I think oftentimes elite is also just focused on political elites. So this would be um, those who are elected to office, those who are running for office, but also the broader um, environment. So those um, cabinet members of the president and, and those involved in sort of the, the broader political um, system. And so I think the, I think political elite opinion matters a lot. And I think in this country where we have two dominant parties, the Democrat and Republican Party, that sort of presenting two sides of the issue. And so uh, on the one hand, we typically get one view from democratic political elites and from Republican political elites. And I think that raises another question, which is how polarized our political system has become. And so it seems to be as Democrats and Republicans become more separated in the political um, world, for example, in Congress, the U.S. Congress is more polarized than it's ever been historically, that it's not, um, it sometimes feels, and I think especially to the public, not that political elites are coming up with what they think are the best policy solutions, but more picking a side and sticking to it no matter what. And that has um, r really important implications for how the public might learn about issues, especially issues that they aren't familiar with. So, I mean, right now, taxes are being debated. Everybody knows they pay taxes. Everybody knows if they paid less taxes, they would presumably have more money. But taxes is a really, really complicated issue. And the, the long-term consequences of tax change is, is complicated. And so if we just have political elites who seem to take a side and say this is good or this is bad, it makes it very hard for the public to learn about this specific policy area and this specific proposal in a way for the public to provide informed input. And so I think from that standpoint, when we think about political elites and political polarization, it, may, it has very serious implications for the ability of, for the public to form informed opinions. So of course, you know, as researchers, as we are discussing these things, like probably if you think back kind of, you know, 10 years ago when we first, you know, started our career doing research versus now, like one thing I think kind of as, as a researcher, we are always trying to dig deeper mm -hmm. and dig deeper. Oh, I found this phenomenon. Why is that? I dig in and I find out, oh, another problem. Keep digging in. So in that sense, if you, if you think from another perspective, so like I think you made a very nice uh, uh arrow-based uh, connections between crime, news media, public opinion, and a criminal justice policy. And uh, there is definitely, even though it's very hard to review, there is definitely this kind of causality, right, uh, among all these different uh, features or matrix. However, if you think from another perspective, for example, crime, news media, public opinion, and crime justice, somehow they are actually in the statistic modeling sense, they are actually the response variables. They are all response mm -hmm. variables. Mm -hmm. They are all the Y variables. Yeah. So there might, like, there might be something 
underneath the society, at a very fun fundamental level, that are actually driving all these response variables. So it kind of, if we think further, I was you know I, I just kind of thinking, what are at the root that are driving you know this crime? Because we are saying that yeah. we, whether the you know, public opinion is associative of media or whether you know the government is trying to kind of you know, match or follow the public you know these are this whole thing they are running together but driven by something mm -hmm. underneath that because I think in the end you know we saw all these problems in either this aspect from in terms of crime or in the other aspect of public opinion or in that, in another aspect of media however in the end when we want to solve the problem do you think that if we can solve the problem just within the circle of crime news media public opinion and criminal justice, or should we jump out of this circle to search for solutions? Yeah, no, that's that's a, that's a great question. I think certainly addressing crime issues is really important. Uh, society wants to feel safe. Society deserves to feel safe. And I think as social scientists, we don't understand what causes crime rates to increase and decrease as much as it seems. So we we know. Um, we know certain things about the crime rate, but the uh, why has the crime rate been decreasing since the mid to late 90s to now? There's a lot of disagreement about the exact causes. And what we often hear is people will point to specific policies. So like policies in New York City. And so, well, there was change in policing policy or something that was done in L.A. But it's interesting different the crime rates in different cities tend to go up and down in a similar way so if their crime rates are changing in similar ways it can't be their different policies that's explaining it all mm -hmm. because they're doing different things and so um, understanding the roots of crime and addressing that is really important I think creating incentives for whatever the issue is media to cover it in a more informed way is crucial but if anything I think our media environment is going the other direction so there's more news sources more media sources more information um, social media is giving um, sound bites like a on Twitter or Facebook and so if anything the incentive is to try to present things in a more simple fast-paced way um, and so I think thinking about how to address the media component of this is really, really challenging. Now, there, there are some interesting examples. So in the criminal justice world, the, um, the Marshall Project is now a project devoted to presenting information related to the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And so you can get great information from the Marshall Project. So because of the evolving media market and the internet, that was able to uh, evolve and, and the Marshall Project's a great resource for news on the criminal justice system. But it's also competing with traditional news, television news, radio news, social media, uh, all sorts of different websites. And so I think that that's um, you know something that society is gonna have to think through. And I, and I don't know if, you know, from a systems engineering perspective, if there's ways to think about the goals and incentives for different media institutions and what the optimal structure might look like. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely a very good idea, kind of you know, taking a systems approach. Uh, and I think kind of a lot of times, and, I, and you mentioned earlier, you say that kind of definitely the society, we want to reduce crime. And of course, kind of researchers, we have been trying to find, find out why crimes uh, happened, right? Of course, it's been very hard but I also have been told by people that, you know, things happen and things happen for a good reason. So which means, you know, if crimes happen, they probably happen for, you know, for a reason. Mm -hmm. However, like as researchers, as for the society, we have not been able to kind of to find out why, what the reason behind these happenings. And actually this kind of, uh, uh, you know, reminds me like you are serving on the Provost Data Science Task Force, mm -hmm. uh, right? Now we are living in the data age. Yeah. So which means that kind of with all this social media, we we have we have you know kind of data networks or sensor networks. Kind of every pieces of data when we combine these things together, 
So probably like the data could help us answer the question you just mentioned to dig out uh, those kind of reasons. So in that sense, so now so far we mentioned kind of two things. One is data science, another one kind of system yeah. systems approach. So how do you think or you know what other kind of emerging weapons for researchers uh, in discovering and finding out more truths mm -hmm. and insights about this kind of, you know, this uh, crime research as well as, you know, their causality relationship between, among all these different factors. What's your view of like data science and system approach? Yeah, oh, I think both have a huge potential to advance our knowledge it, when studying criminal justice issues and, and beyond. And I, I think the, the amount of data lets us get analytical leverage on more topics in a way because ultimately the goal is often causal inference like we don't we want to move beyond just associations and more data often gives us more analytical leverage to try to understand the causal processes I think a responsibility researchers have with more data is making sure they're paying attention to measurement and just it's not just enough to have more data right you have okay. to focus on are you measuring the concepts you want in a valid and reliable way so that's really important. And not just using the data that are available. It's not just, oh, I've got a lot of data. They, they have to be the right data. And I, I think the systems approach, um, and often associated with the systems approach is um, interdisciplinary approach too, right? So thinking about we live in a complicated world with multiple factors and a lot of the most important and pressing social problems need people with expertise in different fields coming together to better understand these issues. And I think the, the, the goal of understanding these issues is to affect them. So I, my book is trying to understand the rise of mass incarceration, but a, a point I often make is if we don't understand how the U.S. got to this point of being the world's leader in incarcerating its citizens, how are we gonna know how to change it and undo this system? And so to me, the goal of understanding something is uh, that's just the first goal. The second goal is using that knowledge to change the system and make it better. Yes, I think yeah, that's definitely very, very important. So, uh, Peter, I noticed that earlier this year, and you received the 2017 Emerging uh, Scholar Award from uh, the Elections, Public Opinion, and also Voting Behavior Section of the American Political Science Association. I, be I believe you know, that's kind of a very top award uh, in, in your field. And also, I know that you know, you are serving as an executive director of the Rupert Center, which is kind of, you know, a prestigious center. So at this stage and for this center, uh, I want you to talk about like your vision for the center and the kind of your, you know, the, how the, the users can use your center and where you are leading the center. Yeah, sure, would, would love to. Yeah, the, the Roper Center has been at Cornell now for two years and it's the world's largest public opinion data archive. And one of the, one of the big advantages, uh, the Roper Center has over 700,000 survey questions, virtually every question ever asked to the US public back to 1935. So this lets us understand how public opinion on crucial issues has changed over time. It also has about 25,000 data sets, the individual responses. And, and so those data allow even uh, further analysis and those uh, are represent, represent over 100 different countries. So we can use the data at the Roper Center to not only understand public opinion in the U.S., but in other countries and, and across time. And so this is a resource that's available to researchers, to students, and, and really one of the, a couple important goals for the, the Roper Center. One is to continue to grow the data archive. And so there's more public opinion data all the time. There's also surveys that have been conducted in the U.S. and especially in other countries. And so increasingly, um, we were contacted or we reach out to people and they're really excited to archive the data with the Roper Center to preserve it permanently and make it accessible. Um, the other thing we want to do is to make the data as accessible as possible. So one frontier we're really working on is um, developing the website for the Roper Center in a way with um, more analysis tools built in. So someone who's maybe not as familiar with public opinion data can come 
search it, find the information they want, and then even see data visualizations or conduct the analyses online without having to have um, necessarily expertise in, in statistics. And so making this uh, a resource that is available to more and more people because I think understanding public opinion can um, help policymakers, help those with nonprofits, help advocates really um, be more successful in implementing uh, their goals. Yes, that, that, that's wonderful. And I believe, you know, the, the center will be so beneficial uh, to the researchers as well as, I, I believe, the general public yeah. right, uh, in the years to come. So, it, Peter, I think the, it's, this is really great because, as I mentioned earlier, this is my first time looking at this kind of criminal and uh, even kind of incarceration. So, but now if I think deeper and I realize actually incarceration, uh, whether we, of course, you know, in your book, you're emphasizing that we are, you know, the incarceration is just going too high. Uh, but now realizing that really this incarceration or being a part of the infrastructure of a nation, right? Even though mm-hmm. kind of it doesn't come to us in the news every day, like for the news, in the news, we, have, we, we all we hear about, oh, well, you know, Bill Gates is doing something, right? Oh, like, you know, Facebook is in all these things. However, if you think about the social infrastructure and actually this kind of incarceration system, right, it really plays a very significant role actually maintaining the stability and the health of our society. And I don't know how many people they got a chance to look at this issue. In that aspect, I believe your book, this you know, incarceration nation, and I think that's going to be very, very important to give people an opportunity to yeah. rethink and uh, to don't, not only rethink, to see, to appreciate, you know, this issue, and then start rethinking where should we go? What is the, for example, optimal path? Right. If there is any optimal path for us to, to go along. Right. Yeah, so I think it's kind of, you know, personally, this is very kind of beneficial, educative to me. So uh, I, I really thank you for getting the chance for me to be educated. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. This is great. Really appreciate the conversation.